So hi, everybody. Julie Panessi here from the Democracy Fund, and I'm very excited because we're about to have what I think is another uh, interesting conversation. And it seems to me that the most important thing we do these days is keep talking, keep the, the wheels of communication greased, because this is what's under, under threat today. And the conversation we're going to have is very much on this point. But I'm joined today by Professor David Haskell. We've chatted before. It was probably I, it's been at least a month, I'm sure, since we chatted, and maybe quite a bit longer ago than that. And we chatted about collectivism and media bias, I remember. Um, mm -hmm. And we had a fascinating conversation. And I think we were not just commenting on what had already happened, but we foreshadowed, because this was before the trucker convoy, right? We were foreshadowing right. yeah. actually a lot of what we ended up seeing uh, in that situation and since. But before I get ahead of myself, um, David is a professor uh, at Wilfrid Laurier University. He's um, in liberal arts and his research area of specialization is in cultural trends and media. And he also has research expertise in the sociology of religion. And the, one of the ways I like to think about this, uh, David, is that you're really um, a specialist in many aspects of human behavior and how we communicate with one another and where our thoughts come from and how we relate to one another, things like that. So, and we talked about a lot of those things the last time we got together, right. but today we're going to chat about this thing I keep hearing about all over the place, Bill 67. Right, right, right. Oh, what is Bill 67 for people who haven't heard of it or who keep hearing about it? there's so many bills in play right now. There's 67, C10, yeah. C16. And I'm thinking, have there always been so many bills around and we just weren't paying attention? But it seems like there's like this, um, an avalanche of them. So what is 67? You know, Julie, you're not wrong. I think that um, some of the people in, in, uh, uh, the political arena have sensed it is a, a moment in time mm -hmm. when they're able to push through legislation that normally they wouldn't have been comfortable pushing through. They would have gotten uh, too much pushback. And uh, whether it was the uh, Emergency Act that was pushed through or these other uh, bills that we're seeing coming to the fore, you wonder, did they just sense that People are exhausted, they're not looking, and therefore they want to push these things through. And, and case in point, we've got this Bill 67. So Bill 67 is an Ontario bill, so it applies to the province of Ontario. It's an education bill. Specifically, it's uh, called the Racial Equity in Education System Act. Now, the bill was drafted by this the sounds NDP. good, I have to say, but that's why we're having a conversation today, right? You know, yeah, okay. It you, sounds you, great. You Equity. It. How yeah, can that be bad? <laughs> and that is exactly it, right? This is a bill that is purposely deceptive. And where we want to go with this is that the wording on the surface has fooled a lot of people. And who doesn't want to be anti-racist, right? But uh, the NDP put it together. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Okay. Fair enough. That was a good response. Um, <laughs> the, the NDP put this thing together and uh, it actually has made it through second reading and it made it through second reading unopposed by the liberals. Well, of course, the liberals are going to fall in line with the NDP, but it was unopposed by Doug Ford's progressive conservatives. All of them voted for it, which is pretty unique for a bill that has been put forward by the NDP. Mm -hmm. So it's gone through second reading. Uh, it's now going to committee. And if it is equally unopposed by third reading, then it becomes law. And as you've already noted, this is a bill. And the worrying thing is the bill purports to be a bill to fight racism. But in fact, it will promote racism. It, it, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that the bill is purposely using omission of information and manipulative language to misrepresent its true, its true intent. In fact, the best way to characterize it, it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. So how, okay, so let's, I really wanna dive into this. So before we start talking about why it's really about this other thing, can you give us a sense of some of the language in it? What is, what is it actually saying? And then we'll talk a little bit about where we think it's coming from and why it might, you know, what it's sort of ushering in between the sure. lines. That's right. Yep. Yep. So uh, let's get right into the language. And this is where the problem lies, actually, uh, in its very initial definition. It says that it, it's setting out to bring 
anti-racism education into every aspect of our public school system from K to 12. So people might think, well, anti-racism, that's good, right? So in section one, it, uh, it says the definition of anti-racism. And it says this specifically, uh, anti-racism means the policy of opposing racism, including anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. Now, looking at that, you think, okay, well, I, I can get behind that. So far, so good. But, so far, so good. But, but one racial group is purposely excluded in that definition. Uh, anti-racism, as it's defined in this bill, endorses or at least allows racism against Caucasians or, or white people. Okay, so that's one problem is the exclusion of certain groups in this that, that, that racism might be targeting. But does it actually define what racism is or what sort of blank phobia is? So you mentioned that some of it's anti-X racism and then some is something like Islamophobia. Are those right. terms ever defined? Uh, no, those terms, those terms aren't. And, We're just supposed and, to know what that means automatically and what it well, includes and, and, and what it doesn't. Actually, what they're hoping is that they're hoping that you don't know what it means. And even at the level of uh, simple words, like using equity instead of equality. So this bill in its very title says that it is looking for racial equity. And they do that intentionally because, and, and I think it's about 20 or 30 times that equity appears, but never equality. What is and, the difference to you? Oh, well, the difference is very clear to me. Uh, equity is not equality. Equality means treating people, everybody the same. But equity means treating people differently. Uh, according to their race, in this case, it is a good thing to treat people differently according to their race. And that's, the, that's really the raison d'etre of anti-racism. We want to treat people differently. And in this case, uh, it's it's outright what we used to consider racism itself. So if we think about, um, if we take it out of the race context for a minute and look at the gender issue, affirmative action would be an equity policy, not an equality policy, because it right. is, what, does that make sense? So that it, it's, it's, it's suggesting that you do treat people differently in order to achieve balance or equality or something between them, right? That's right. I was, I interviewed Bruce Party a while ago. It was really about the sort of the trucker situation, but we ended up talking about, um, you know, how the courts are interpreting various concepts like this. And we were talking about the language of racism in the courts and then the language of racism that we, you know, we saw from our prime minister in the house when he was trying to defend the invocation of the Emergencies Act. And, and Bruce was saying that, you know, we used to mean by a racist someone who thought that race matters. And now by a racist, we mean someone who doesn't think race matters, right? So if you don't think it matters that there's a difference between me and a black person, now I'm a racist. And this yeah. is really the, the soul of anti-racism education. This is the soul of this bill. And what you've mm -hmm. identified there is this notion of concept creep. And there was a, a scholar out of the uh, University of Melbourne and um, Haslam was his name, Nick Haslam. And he, in 2016, put together this paper where he was talking about concept creep. And we see it here where a, a word no longer means what people think it means. So racism, now as Bruce had defined it, he was saying, you know, you, you actually think that there's a difference between people and you think that one group uh, because of their race is, is superior, another is inferior, but now it's all changed. And other, other examples of this are, well, white supremacy has now taken on a new meaning. For example, um, under anti-racism pedagogy, the stuff of this bill, right. um, white supremacy, you think, well, KKK, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, Ku Klux Klan. Now white supremacy is, is simply this idea that um, you would think merit and competency should be the guide for people advancing in society. If you think that, you're a white supremacist. And th the why, idea why of- is that? This is so interesting, right? Why? Because I was talking with someone a while ago about even something like consistency, 
in our print, which is a basic analytic logical idea, right? You can't believe that both this thing is true and its opposite is true at the same time, right? You, you, right. Have, to, you have to be consistent. But um, my understanding is that those who are more of the critical theory mindset would say that, well, you only value consistency because you belong to this traditional white male created uh, infrastructure of thought. So now not even consistency is what we might call a first principle or something that can be relied on to structure our thinking, right? Right. And, and did you notice that what it is, it's an attack on almost every good thing that came out of the Enlightenment? The ideas of the Enlightenment are, are let... <laughs> uh, yeah. And so the idea is that these are not... Um, these are not things related to the color of skin. It, these were ideas meant to benefit everybody. That would you transcend know? those differences. Right? That's exactly right. it. And, and so we've moved, uh, well, what you mentioned critical theorists and critical race theory. Critical race theory is really the foundation that is underpinning this bill 67. So critical race theory is, is the larger scholarly movement. And it's never mentioned in this bill. I should be clear about that. Uh, but definitely, it is underpinning this bill. And I can see why they didn't use critical race theory, because right now it is a, a hot topic. In the United States, there's a lot of pushback against critical race theory, because in fact, it is racist at its heart. And so instead, they're using this term anti-racism, and I would say it's done to win approval. Uh, if they use critical race theory, people would say, well, what's that all about? By using the term anti-racism, it's purposely misleading in order to get this, get a foot in the door and get bills like this passed. And who doesn't want to be anti-racist, right? But, but that's not what it means. Wait, By anti-racist... So, sorry, sorry? I'll, I'll, let me just jump in and ask this kind of simple question. Does that explain why everyone, except for, I think, the Blue Party voted in favor of this bill? Because they just didn't read very carefully and they thought anti-racism sounds good. Moving on to the next thing. I mean, is I think it possibly as simple as that? <laughs> well, OK, it could. Well, for the NDP, they know. They know. I mean, the person who actually was the drafter of this bill was uh, Laura May Lindo. She's at and, your school, um, no? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. She, she was um, formerly- An the, academic. Uh, she, well, she was the head of equity and diversity at Laurier. And um, she, she oversaw some pretty dramatic changes here that actually had to be reversed in the end because she had actually overstepped. It was related to our gender and sexual violence policy, if I recall correctly that it was found to be at odds with what was legally uh, possible. She'd gone beyond, um, in, in the same way that this bill, I would suggest, goes beyond what would be good for the harmony of society. Hmm. But uh, are, they, are they just oblivious to it? Maybe. Um, maybe some of Doug Ford's MPPs were oblivious to it. But there's an, inter you know, an interesting case here. Um, there's a, a new party, the Ontario Party. And the Ontario Party... Uh, has a sitting MP, Rick Nichols. Now, mm -hmm. the Ontario Party has specific policy against this kind of stuff. It, mm -hmm. it is, the Ontario Party is totally against critical race theory. They even have an education policy that says, we won't allow this kind of stuff, this divisive stuff to be taught. Well, mm -hmm. Rick Nichols, their one sitting MP, did vote in favor of this Bill 67. And, and some of the, the leadership of his party said, Rick, what have you done? And he said, I didn't realize. I didn't realize. And so here we have someone whose yeah. party is actually dedicated in policy to against this stuff who was just oblivious. Well, and, and that's this is the an danger. interesting story because Rick Nichols was a, was a conservative MPP. Right, right. Uh, and he, he left because, right? He left because he didn't comply with the policy of the conservative party. Right, this guy is used to standing against yeah. It's, it's not like he would go along with the group just to go along with the group. Yeah. I really, if he had known what this, the true intent of this bill was, he would have, just as he did before, when he stood against the vaccine mandate policy, mm -hmm. I'm sure that, it, you know, it's right in his, the policy of, of the Ontario party. He would have fallen well, behind the Ontario party, but 
that's the that's if what you're suggesting is true you know i mean the, the people who voted for this bill fall into one of two general camps one is they know exactly what it's about that it's a it's it's a it's a you know it's a tool of critical race theory and they're voting in support of that overall right. agenda uh or they thought it sounded good and really weren't aware aren't aware of what it's about and so that's partly why it's so important to have conversations like this to to understand what it's about and i um derailed you with that question because you were about to explain critical race theory a little bit more and I'd love it if you could do that because I think that um I just think this is really misunderstood and I think it's in part because it's a weird name for a concept right so critical race theory suggests okay there's a theory about critical race what is critical race well right? I mean we gosh we we go all the way back to the nomenclature problem yeah yeah uh uh, okay, you know what the easiest way to do this is I'll, I'll quickly talk about critical race theory and just give kind of the pedigree. So we go back to Marxism, if you really want to, to find the gist of the idea, this idea that there are the oppressors and the oppressed. And under Marx, the oppressors are the people who own the uh, means of production, the capitalists, and then the workers are the oppressed. And there's some legitimacy to that, especially when Marx was writing it. There were, there were crony capitalists and they were oppressing people, not giving them fair wage. So there's always that kernel of truth in there. Mm -hmm. Well, then that idea of uh, oppressor, uh, oppressed oppressor is then reimagined by the um, Frankfurt School, which is out of Germany. And they, they come to the United States, some scholars from Germany come to the United States, and they really form a school of critical theory. And critical theory takes the ideas of Marxism and then applies it more to the culture. And there are the oppressors and the oppressed. Now, in this case, the oppressor happens to be whatever is the dominant culture. And it can be, uh, if you're in North America, Christianity will be an oppressor. Uh, males will be an oppressor. Uh, white or Caucasian people Back will be Back then you oppressor. mean the Frankfurt School first came. Yes, uh, I'm America. sorry, say. But, well, because I'm wondering, right? I don't know if it's if it could be said that you know white Christian males are the oppressor today still. So I'm wondering that. that oh, would no, 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 no. Back then, then. oh, I back understand. Then, yes. Right? So, sorry. Now I see. Back then, yes, back then. But here's the thing, Julie. Uh, that ideology doesn't depend on empirical evidence. It's very clear that uh, it doesn't have to be real for them to say that it is their truth. So you, you just made the point expertly that back then they were saying that the Christian uh, male um, white was the oppressor, but then perhaps that changed because of demographic trends. They don't care about that. They're still saying that those, that, those groups, that, that demographic are the oppressors. Mm -hmm. And this flies in the face of empirical evidence, for example, uh, in Canada, if, um, if you look at Statistics Canada data, for example, you'll see that um, Asian Canadians by the second generation, they have greater educational attainment, they have higher family income and even individual income than, than whites. So that, that suggests that they are dominant, at least in the area of education and, and economics. Mm -hmm. but, you see, that doesn't matter to the people who are the critical race theorists, because this is where it becomes a little bit more like a religion. Mm -hmm. um, they, they take these things often as an article of faith. Once they've identified the oppressor, that is the oppressor. They're not willing to be convinced by new evidence, the insertion of new evidence. And, and you as a philosopher would know, the only time you have a rational thought is when that thought can be changed by the introduction of new evidence. That's how we say, oh, it's rational. That's how, I that's would argue. how the analytics say what's, what's rational. But, but my understanding is that um, critical theorists not only don't value um, rationality, well, they, it's not only that they don't value the presentation of evidence as a, as a mark of rationality, but it's not clear that they value rationality because rationality operates uh, on binary principles, right? So something is, is true or false. Mm -hmm. As you say, it can be changed with the presentation of new information. It also allows for the possibility that you would think differently from those around you. And, and thank you for bringing that up because 
we really return now to this idea of white supremacy. What they would say is our desire to have empirical evidence, our desire to have these measures, these analytical measures, that's just rooted in this oppressive system. And therefore, they can now call it all white supremacy. They're able to use this epithet, this terrible word, to shut down the argument. And, and that's part of their ploy as well, right? As soon as you try to say, but wait, what about empirical evidence? Then they'll call it white supremacy. And who wants to be a white supremacist? It really is predicated on a couple things. Critical theory is, one, they want to have their truth. And two, if you try to at least interact with them, they then will use slurs so that you can't even make your argument, right? It's, it's, they're going to start throwing mud. And, uh, and of course, I want to get back to this bill. These very ideas will be promoted from K to 12 if this bill, Bill 67, actually makes its way uh, through our provincial legislature. Well, um, one of the reasons why I asked you earlier is, does the bill define racism? One of the reasons I asked that is because we need to understand what it is that this, what kind of behavior this bill is going to allow and prevent. And it's not clear to me that it's circumscribing, be, cir cir circumscribing behavior in any way other than preventing behavior that someone else doesn't want whatever that is, because it right. seems like we're entering a new era where things like um, suppression and offense and harm are true if you feel they are true. They are true if you feel that they have happened to you. They're not objectively determined. Why? Well, because we're no longer interested in whether or not there's evidence for your harm or evidence for you being oppressed. You are oppressed if you feel oppressed. Right. And so is that what we're saying that um, a five, you know, a, a, a student in grade five could be guilty of racism if the student sitting next to him or her in class simply accuses that student of racism? Uh, under the ideas of anti-racism, as it is on, under the greater auspices of critical race theory, yes. I mean, and that's let's. If people don't believe us when, you know, we're, we're kind of agreeing on this, but if people didn't agree with us, what I would suggest is, is look at the thought leaders within this movement of critical race theory and anti-racism or so-called anti-racism. And the thought leaders in, in this movement are Robin D'Angelo, who wrote a book called White Fragility. And there's another fella, Ibram Ken Kendi, who wrote How to Be Anti-Racist. You can't be more clear than that. He is writing a book, How to Be Anti-Racist. <laughs> now, these two, in their work, uh, and this is well known, so D'Angelo, she tells us in her work that only whites can exercise power, and thus only whites can be racist. Now, if you're a logical person, you take that premise and you say, okay, only whites can exercise power. This is what she says, and then you think, well, wasn't Barack Obama president of the United States, it can't, from that logical uh, thought, don't we suddenly think, well, didn't he exercise power? What about Oprah? Doesn't she exercise power? So there are simple thought experiments one can do without having to have uh, really any deep, deep analysis just to say, this doesn't sound right. Well, it's not she also descriptively untrue for the reasons that you mentioned but it seems to be a self-defeating kind of ideology. If I'm not white, then I am by nature powerless. So how can I have meaning in my life? How can I have purpose? Why is there any reason to get up in the morning? Why? It, it just seems to make your life vacuous in term, just by how you define it. Absolutely. According to your nature. But then I wonder, that is exactly what's happened. Because if you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, a lot of that has been about embracing a kind of victimhood as part of their identity. Very true. And there's a and scheme of feminism that does that as well. It, right. it's, it's really, so this is, you've hit the second part of why this is so troubling. And perhaps even more troubling. So we know for sure 
that so-called anti-racism pedagogy, when taught in schools, does teach. It teaches uh, white students that you are inherently evil, you're inherently racist, and also you are responsible for the sins of any white person in the past, regardless of your relation to them. You are responsible for mm -hmm. any harm your, your group, your racial group has done. So that's, that's insidious enough. But what you've just hit on is for the students of color, they're now told you can't succeed. You don't have agency. You are a perpetual victim. You are uh, without agency. You cannot, the, the game is rigged against you. How deflating is that? And how dishonest is that? And, and again, I'll say why it is so dishonest. Mm. I can prove that that isn't true. I can prove that uh, your skin color does not predicate whether or not you will succeed. Um, let me steel man this argument. So in the United States, uh, Nigerian blacks in the United States have higher educational attainment and higher income than the average white American. And they don't, it's not that those Nigerian blacks uh, who have immigrated to the United States, they don't have white privilege, but what they do have is incredible work ethic. They also have very strong families. Now, of course, I'm generalizing now. I mean, this is the, this is the terrible thing. It makes us generalize about race. And, and, and I mean, we don't even want to go here. We want to look at people as individuals. But just to, to, to fulfill this example, what you can see is what really matters at the level of success are variables that have nothing to do with race. Yeah, it seems to me that nothing makes race matter more than bills like um, the one we're talking about and critical, critical race theory. Um, and it creates a number of double standards between people, right? So if it's, the, if it's the case that white people living now are responsible for all the sins of white people in the past, but that's not true of other races, right? And, and it also I mean, means there's no connection. I mean, if you're, you, you can't say that you're not responsible for the bad things that other people of your race have done in the past, but that you are responsible for the good things they've done. That doesn't make any sense. And if you're not allowed to say either of those things, then in virtue of what do you have a connection with your ancestors? So it seems like we're ultimately doing a disservice to people of other race by saying that white people are the only people who are sort of allowed to bear the responsibility of the actions of white persons of the past. And uh, the thought experiment that needs to be done, and, and it's so simple, is you just say, you're talking about all, uh, when you group people into a monolith, so it's all white people are this, right? Mm -hmm. Immediately, my mind goes to, you, you are aware of the, the Quakers who are pacifists, right? You are aware of the Mennonites, right? You are aware of these massive groups of people who just happen to be Caucasian, <laughs> who have done immense work in terms of peace, unity. Um, the, the Quakers, as some people may know, the Quakers were instrumental in stopping the slave trade in the UK and the US. These people were all about racial harmony. Are those white people also responsible for these terrible things? You just can't group people into a monolith. Well, is it white people who are thought to be responsible for racial injustice? or a particular kind of white ideology? According to people like Robin DiAngelo, uh, it is white people. It is just the whole group can be demonized. Uh, here's a quote, I have a quote from her. She says, a positive white identity, this is everybody, a positive white identity is an impossible goal. White identity is inherently racist. White people, do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. That is every single person, regardless of their character, remember of, regardless of what they've done for the good, they've now been demonized according to, and, and rightly so, according to Robin DiAngelo. So she's saying that it's impossible not to be a racist if you're white. That is her contention. And when we move into other people like Kendi, so Ibram Kendi, who, literally wrote the book, How to Be Anti-Racist. Uh, he goes a little bit further 
And he strongly advocates discriminating against white people. Uh, let, let me read his quote. He says, um, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. But I, David, th this just seems like this bill is useless because, I mean, if it's impossible to be anti-racist as a white person and it's impossible to be racist as a non-white person, then the bill is either unnecessary for people who are non-white or it'll be wholly ineffective for the whites. So it's a useless bill according you, to critical race theorists. But am I understanding strong. the system or am I? <laughs> you are, and, and, and when you dig into it, you say, well, I mean, we've already talked it about it. It seems absurd to me. I, it's just completely it, absurd. And it would be laughable if it wasn't so dangerous. It would be laughable if it wasn't being put in place and damaging uh, students, both students of color, white students, um, and teaching them these pathologies. Can you give us an it's, example uh, of what this would look like in elementary school? So I think you said earlier that the goal is to create anti-racist pedagogy in all disciplines, in all subjects in elementary and high school, right? So what, what would this look like in, I mean, are we talking about geography and math class and history, presumably? And Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it can be worked in anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, when it's when it's worked into history, it's pretty easy. History, you can you can tell the students that um, historically uh, white people. You know what? I'll, I'll give you an example. Here's I'm going to give you an example that just came from uh, the last in February. This was from February, and and then I'll tie it into a history lesson because it, it's rooted in fact. So we at, I'm in the Waterloo Region Board. It's the public board in Waterloo Region. And one of the heads of equity in the Waterloo Region um, actually put out on her public social media, she wrote this. She, she said, history is paved with white-led violence. And her larger comment, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, was her larger message was that white people are deceivers and that they will use words like freedom as a pretext to commit violence. And that was really where she was going when she said, quote, history is paved with white led violence. So this is, this is an employee of the very public school board that my kids go to saying that, and not ashamed to say this, that, that history is paved with white led violence. That nobody else, right? It suddenly becomes the exclusive property of whites. So how does that work into the curriculum? Well, if the head of equity is saying that publicly, she will uh, definitely give the green light to any teacher to say things like that in their history lessons as well. Again, it's so asymmetrical. We, we only talk about the, uh, the oppressor, the, mm -hmm. right? And, and Whites nothing are the about, only oppressors and they're the only ones that can and have, or that have and can cause harm. Right, but to the exclusion of anything good they might've done. Mm -hmm. We won't talk about the hundreds of thousands of uh, white soldiers during the Civil War in the United States who actually fought against slavery. We'll, we'll ignore that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, such a, it's such a terrible educational system because it's so in error. Mm -hmm. It's such a shame, I think, that we, um, we lose a lot in terms of the ability to think about what unites us as people. Right, and we talk, we talk in philosophy a lot about how important it is to minimize superficial differences or differences that you can't do anything about. You right. can't do any, I mean, I was gonna say, you can't do anything about the fact that you're born a man or a woman, but let's not get into that conversation today. <laughs> we'll do another talk about that. Um, but you know, you can't, you, can't, you can't choose how tall you're going to be to a certain extent. You can't choose to which parents you're born. You can't um, choose what 
you know, your eye color is, but because you can't choose them, we generally think in moral philosophy that, that they're, they're not significant differences between people. We think that what's most important to who you are, are those things that you, you have control over, right? That what you're able to take responsibility for. And if we're going to say, um, you know, you, David, in virtue of being a white man, can't help but be as awful as you are, then there's no reason for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm basically telling you, there's no reason to work on yourself. There's no reason to engage in self-reflection. There's no reason to look historically through your own life, through the lives of other white men, to understand where things went wrong and how you could make it better so that things would be better in the future. Like there's no, there's no room for self-reflection, regret, learning about yourself, moving forward, trying to um, correct past wrongs, whether they're racial wrongs or any other kind of wrongs. And there's no reason really to try to improve oneself or to try to build relationships with people of other genders or other races, because it's all going to be an inevitable failure, according to this theory. It, it is an incredibly, not only so unscientific, unscientific. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the, um, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, what this could lead to, right? Um, and, and whenever you pursue a path that is just patently untrue, based on falsehoods, it can't lead to anywhere good. Uh, there's, um, there's a scholar at uh, Princeton University, and his name is Russell Neely. He's a political scientist, and he's, he's just done some terrific work uh, looking at the cultural implications, the societal implications of these kind of ideas. So the ideas that are put forth in critical race theory or in, in its so-called anti-racism are the ideas that I, uh, I'm going to abandon neutrality and I'm going to favor one group and I'm going to make sure that I punish uh, to the, in any ways I can or at least discriminate against another group. And so Russell Neely has said, well, what happens in societies where this is done. And so he does this massive work. I can't re recall the name of, he's written several books on this, but he's done this massive work and he looks at it from a historical perspective. He looks at it from a statistical perspective and he even looks at it from uh, an evolutionary biological perspective. And here's what he came up with. I'll try to pin it down. He comes up with this idea of the reciprocity norm. And he says, it all comes down to the reciprocity norm. He says, uh, at one point, in, in some societies, they said, you know, if we want to move ahead, if we want to have a society where we can have flourishing, prospering, we need to figure out a way not to always be fighting as tribes. So here's what, I, what we're going to propose. I'm not going to let my tribe move ahead based on their immutable characteristics or something related to the tribe. Instead, we're going to have a more objective criteria, and it's going to be merit and competency. We're going to use merit and competency because it's something that people can come to uh, more fairly, more fairly. Of course, you know, people are going to start out at different, different levels, but overall, it's so much better. It's so much better if we use this more neutral criteria than saying, I'm going to advance my tribe because they look like me. They believe like me, these other things. So Neely says that um, insofar as a society embraced this reciprocity norm, I won't advance my tribe if you don't advance yours, society flourishes. But anytime you begin to insert this idea that, well, there's good discrimination, right. we're going to just discriminate against this group for noble causes. He says, things begin to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And and you just can't reverse it. It's never led to society getting better. The only thing that has has been the reciprocity norm. As soon as you contravene the reciprocity norm, it, it slowly begins to degrade and then it just snowballs out of control. You know, Aristotle spoke, I think, very interestingly on the topic of discrimination. And when I used to teach classes, I would often 
uh, import what he had to say about it. He wasn't talking about racial discrimination, I don't think, but um, I imported into discussions about affirmative action and, and racial uh, and racism and, and things like that. And he said, you know, discrimination is not always bad. Discrimination is just choosing one thing over another, making a choice. But when it becomes bad, it does so because we're discriminating or making a choice on the basis of irrelevant characteristics. That's when we hit unjustified discrimination. And so it seems, I love that. Um, isn't that great? And so it seems yeah. now like um, discriminating against someone is not always bad. Choosing a candidate for a position who is more qualified than another one is not bad. You're discriminating against the one who is less qualified, less skilled, less interesting in an interview, all of that. When it becomes bad is when you choose against a candidate because you don't like the color of her shirt or the color of her skin, right? That's right. And so it seems like what critical race theory is doing is, is doubling back on itself and doing that again and making differences that shouldn't matter, matter. And that doesn't mean that one shouldn't embrace one's race or be proud of one's race or celebrate blackhood even or womanhood if we're talking about gender. But it does mean that we shouldn't make those things matter when they start doing things like separating us and making us hate each other. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, to me, as you were, you were saying how Aristotle approached it, I mean, it just resonates so much with me. And this is something I think it would even resonate with children. I mean, what kind of education should we be doing? As instead of this so-called anti-racism, it's stuff exactly like that, Julie, where, where we say, yes, you are going to have to make choices, which is discrimination. Mm -hmm. But when you do, you do it on those things that aren't immutable characteristics. I, I think it's important that at some point, we should be teaching kids in kindergarten and grade one, we should be asking them the question because I think they'll come to the answer pretty quickly. Should you judge someone as an individual or should you judge someone according to the group to which they belong to? Uh, yeah. The group meaning that they all have the same skin color. Mm -hmm. Well, even kids in, in kindergarten, they would be able to think through that and say, well, of course you shouldn't. I, don't, I can't know anything about someone just based on the color of their skin. That's not something that lets me know about them. Uh, but if I judge them I, at the level of the individual, then it makes perfect sense. Fear so, that bills like this and a similar kind of pedagogy will mean now that, you know, when, when say little girl Sally doesn't choose Martha to be on her team at school and Martha happens to be black, Sally's going to be told it was bad that you didn't choose her because she was black. When what she should really be told is it was bad you didn't choose her because that hurt her. And we this, don't want to hurt people without good reason. You know, the things that you're saying are the things that need to be taught. And there is, a, I, you know, sometimes we, we talk about these things and it can be quite depressing, but there are rays of hope. There is a group called FAIR, and it's um, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. And they started in the U.S. and... Uh, uh, John McWhorter is on the board. Steve Pinker is on the board. These are some heavy hitter intellectuals there. I think Glenn Lowry might be on the board as well. Um, these are university professors uh, who are just, you know, strongly, strongly pro-human. Anyway, FAIR has now come to Canada. We have a, a chapter in Toronto. We have a chapter in Ontario. And this organization is gathering parents and anyone who really wants to see people treated equally. They, like, like you, like me, they're against racism, as racism should be understood, mm -hmm. uh, where you actually are denigrating someone because of the color of their skin, but they're against discrimination based on immutable characteristics. Mm -hmm. So I keep saying, you know, what you are, you are the, the ideas you're articulating are the things that should be taught. And FAIR is actually trying to create alternative curriculum that the schools can then use. And so there, there are these green shoots, these rays of sunshine where people are aware of what's going on and they are trying to make a change and they're trying to give the words so that other people can speak those words because maybe they couldn't articulate how they were feeling. 
I've had something in the back of my mind pretty much the whole time since we've been talking. I can't, I can't help but think of it, but it's an idea that I, I don't have fully worked out. So I'll give you the pieces and then maybe you can put it together a little bit. And I, and I sort of hate to, to delve into the COVID issue, but, but I do wonder if what we're talking about today is behind much of the stigmatization in society right now against those who choose to remain unvaccinated. You know, and I think back to, was it a year ago today that the Toronto Star published that horrific front page where, right, where they're saying the unvaccinated, they don't deserve medical care, I don't care if you die, I hate you and all of that. And if we try to connect what we're saying today, I know we're talking about race specifically, but it's not just about a skin color issue. It's about how we're supposed to feel about people who are different from us in some respect, right? Whether that's some feature of ourselves that we've chosen, like our medical choices, or something we haven't chosen, like, like our skin color. And I mean, what we're kind of talking about today um, are non-whites blaming whites for their the harms they suffer, for their oppression, for being, um, for feeling any kind of offense, right? So, so blacks hating, blacks hating whites, for example, for putting them in that position. But it although, seems like although, we're, yeah, I, I would just nuance that a bit because when you look yeah. at the sociological data, it is not people of color. It is not blacks who hold this uh, opinion. But this is what greatly. the theorists are saying they ought to be feeling. And so, you know, I, I want uh, to um, just. Hmm. in the name of nuance, point out that, that really a strong majority of, of Blacks, of people of color, they don't hold these right. critical race theory views. These are being pushed by elite uh, Caucasians on the far left or on the left. David, I think this is just going to make the metaphor even stronger. Right. So mm -hmm. let me reframe, reframe that those terms a little bit then. So if critical race theorists are saying that blacks, you should hate whites because of the position you're in, then we might say that certain defenders of the COVID narrative are saying to the vaccinated, you should hate the unvaccinated because of the position they're putting you in, that position being arguably the, the prolongation of the pandemic, having to continue to wear masks and social distance only because these ridiculously unscientific unvaccinated people are putting you in that position. Is that a coincidence? Am I reading too much into that parallel? Am I making an analogy where there isn't one naturally? No, it, well, uh, it is really, there's the, these movements whether it's the so-called anti-racist movement, critical race theory movement, mm -hmm. the uh, people, the mobs that are now attacking the vaccine hesitant, it's really, it's really the same thing happening. Their, their way of operating is the same. Uh, typically, it's the same kind of elites who are more on the left uh, that are driving this. And so a couple of things are happening there. One, they, they really do um, suppress the debate from the other side. They don't allow the empirical evidence from the other side to there, appear. There's no evidence given, no evidence demanded. That's right. And maybe even, even more, what we're seeing in, in, within this movement of critical race theory, it really does mimic religion. And religion has articles of faith that don't require evidence. First and religion has, uh, when it's a fundamentalist kind of religion, it really does insist that those who do not pass the purity test of doctrine, they're, they're not just uh, people with bad ideas, they're bad people, right? They're the heretics, they're dangerous. Um, if you look back at, at the, uh, the purges of the Middle Ages, I mean, what do you do to a heretic? You burn them. Well, in the COVID uh, age, you fire them from their jobs and you make them, you expel them from university. But that impulse is always there. And at the root of that impulse is a rejection of the Enlightenment idea of tolerance. So we had this great run, probably just coming out of the 1700s uh, <laughs> into maybe 2013, where we understood tolerance to be the idea that you are saying something that I disagree with, 
but you're allowed to say it. Mm -hmm. And now tolerance has been exchanged for acceptance. And acceptance is the only negotiable. So that is to say, you either accept what I'm saying, what I'm compelling you to believe, or you are the enemy. So we've abandoned the idea of, of tolerance, although they, they still, the, I'll say it's the elites on the left, they've even commandeered that word of tolerance. But what they really mean is acceptance. They're saying you need to be tolerant of this. You need to be tolerant of this. But what they mean is you either accept this or you'll be punished. So somewhere in the root of all this uh, upheaval, this disharmony, is a rejection of the idea of tolerance. I mean, it's so counterintuitive and illogical to me. I feel like I wouldn't even be able to remember it if I was going to choose to become a far left critical theorist. It seems so hard even to wrap one's head around, right? But I think, but I think you're quite right that, that what they're saying is you accept this idea, not because of evidence, not because it's logical, not because it makes sense, not because it produces better outcomes, but because it's part of the ideology. You accept it or you don't matter. You're canceled. You're not going That's to work right. at the universities, as you say. You're not going to have employment. You might not be able to eat or bank or get gas. We'll see. 2023 is probably going to be very interesting. Um, but, you know, I also have to ask you, and um, I think we're, we're getting close to our time being up, but why are we seeing bills about ideology anyway? I mean, this is about, this is a bill about not just what you're allowed to say or do to another person, but really about the ideas that you're allowed to hold. And the ideas a person holds are formed so much by what they're taught when you're in your formative years. Um, why is this becoming a matter of the state? Why are we seeing, this is probably going to pass, right? It's gone through its second reading. And why would anyone who has voted for it so far vote against it in the third reading? The well, you know, maybe they'll there'll be so much static. People will watch uh, this conversation between right. you and me, and, and people will say, <laughs> "Whoa, I didn't I didn't realize it was happening." But yeah. uh, one one thing that I would I would say uh, is that you said you 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 made me think about what what the implications are here, and. They want, they, they really want the people behind this bill. They, they, they think they have the truth. They don't trust parents mm -hmm. to be the educators of their own kids. And so they want to, to take as much control. This is really about power. And to prove that within this bill, within this bill, it will compel new teachers, every new teacher in the province of Ontario, will have to receive training uh, that tells them, here's what to teach related to anti-racism. And again, anti-racism is racism. Uh, also, the advancement of every teacher is going to be linked to performance appraisals where they are judged whether or not they have put enough of this so-called anti-racism pedagogy into their classes. Mm -hmm. So, so this is, is, is a power play like we've not seen. And, and let's say that you were a teacher and you were trying to be more balanced and you were trying to say, maybe, maybe you've watched podcasts like yours, Julie, and you say, this doesn't sound right to me. I, I don't like that they are coming at this with no evidence. And so I'm gonna bring some evidence into my classroom. We're going to be talking today, maybe it's a high school class and they wanna be talking about police violence. And, and maybe it's a social studies class. And they say, we're going to talk about police violence today. And we're going to look at the evidence. And we're going to see that um, the work of Harvard sociologist Roland Fryer, for example, this is true. Uh, he studied this. And Roland Fryer is a, a, a Black academic. He studied lethal force used by police. And what he found was that there simply is not any evidence that when police use uh, lethal force, that it is linked to race. That is to say that uh, white police officers don't go out and try to shoot black officers or, or black um, uh, suspects. And um, likewise, black officers are equally likely to shoot a black 
suspect. So Roland Fryer found that there just isn't any empirical evidence for this narrative that the police are, are trying to gun down black men. So let's say you were a, a teacher and you wanted to, to do that, you want to talk about that. Well, that goes against anti-racism education. It goes against this idea of lived experience. So if you had a student in your class who really felt that no, the police are out to get, out to get uh, people of color. I really feel that. Mm -hmm. Well, suddenly you potentially have committed racism. Mm -hmm. And under this bill, under this bill, uh, a person who disrupts or um, uses racial, racial language or racial, racial activities in the classroom can be fined $200 a pop. Plus, of course, you'd be stigmatized throughout your school and the board and potentially put on leave, but they've even worked that into the bill. So that empirical, so the way that I would see it happening, even the insertion of empirical evidence, if it went against the anti-racism narrative, well, then you're guilty of racism. Which is not only problematic in terms of teaching students how to think through this particular issue about race, but it's also teaching students how research works and how, or how it shouldn't work and what counts as evidence and information and whether those things matter. And, 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 and those, will for, those ideas will form their thinking about how to make decisions and how to go through life and what kinds of programs they wanna choose when they get to university or college, if they choose to go on to one of those things. It will inform their thinking about how to read a newspaper, how to get information online. I mean, I think you're quite right in thinking that this is very, it, the, the underlying, um, the underlying ideological assumptions that have nothing to do with race even are very concerning when we see them delivered in bills like this. And, you know, I mean, I think this is going to lead to broader questions. You, you mentioned this earlier that, that the, the assumption will be that parents do, will not do this as well as the school. If it's a public school, then it's a function of the state. Parents cannot be trusted to raise their children with the right ideas. So we're living in a country where the state says, you, you who birthed these children, who have coddled them at night when they're sick, who give them food, who bandage their knees when they get hurt, who have shirts soaked with their tears when they're crying, you can't be trusted to raise your children with the right ideas. So we're going to take them for eight hours a day, and we're going to do that for you. And if your child goes home and you don't like what they've learned, then you're the one who's in the wrong, and you will have no legal recourse, no recourse with the school board or, the, or your teachers, presumably, to do anything about that. And if you really want to push that, you can take them out of the school system and see how well you fare. But we certainly aren't going to protect you or compensate for you or allow any kind of um, arena in which you can challenge or fight those ideas. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's why I think we need to begin looking for political solutions insofar as as one can. Um, that will begin to offer alternative ideas, right? We need, uh, we can't keep doing the same old, same old. People had put a lot of stock in Doug Ford's government. They thought, oh, he's going to come in and he's, he's really going to be pro-parent. Uh, and he, in, it, he intimated that he would. He was, he was um, saying a lot of interesting things when he came in uh, as premier and he's gone back on every one of them. And right. so you begin to wonder, do we need a different, political solution. And, and so uh, you look at, uh, again, uh, so the Ontario party is, is putting forth this idea that they will give funding to parents to choose the educational option they want. The, they're saying also that they will make it illegal for uh, the public system to teach things like you are accountable for the mistakes of, of your ancestors and you are uh, inherently racist because uh, you are of a particular skin color. So, I mean, apart from finding new political solutions, I don't know, do we all just go and move into the woods or something? Because I don't know what else there is. Well, I think that, I mean, thank you so much for talking with me about this today. What I really appreciated is not just a discussion of this bill and to help to give people a sense of what it's about, but hopefully 
hopefully you people watching, please don't take our word for it. Please take a look at this bill online and, 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 you know, think about what we've been saying about it and see if that makes sense to you and just use it as an opportunity, please, to, to think through this and think if this is what you want um, our children to be learning and whether, I think the bigger questions though, are whether or not the state should be into our governments, right? Our provincial and federal governments should be involved in making decisions about what our children learn, whether they should be involved in making decisions about, about our healthcare in the way that, that they have been over the last couple of years. And I mean, we're, we're moving to a place in Canada where there's that, that autonomous private sphere for the individual is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and we are being made to feel guilty and evil even for the extent to which we want to protect it and keep it, right? So David, thank you so much for being with us. Do you have any last thoughts or questions or anything you want to leave people with? Uh, you know, there's a, a fun quote that I want to, want to give um, because it sort of summarizes this idea of, of what could happen or what is already happening actually, and what will be even worse if Bill 67 makes its way through and becomes law. I'm taking this from a, um, uh, a philosopher and an author, um, and he's also a pastor. His name is Vody Bauckham. And he says, uh, when you send your kids off to Caesar to be educated, don't be surprised when they come home Romans. And so I would say that that's a, a good way to think about this because more and more, we're abdicating our responsibilities, and it's time to pull those back and say, no, our kids are, are, are ours, and we're going to keep it that way. I think we also need to realize that institutional education is not the only form of education. Um, children are being educated every moment of every day. Every day they're awake. Every, every little thing they hear, everything they see, everything the adults or the other children around them tell them. Um, it's all part of their education in which humans are being educated our whole lives, you know, and um, it's not only up to people whose profession it is to be a teacher to do that job. And uh, we, we certainly have at the very least an awful lot to think about moving forward. And we need to, I think, make these decisions proactively and consciously, and not just as I think you've been suggesting some of our M MPPs have done, and just say, well, this doesn't matter, this will be fine. It's just an unconscious sort of decision, you know. Um, David, thank you, as always, I'm sure we'll have other conversations in the future. I, I hope so, Julie, I really enjoy this. It's, it's such a great time. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks for hanging out with me today. If you enjoyed watching this video, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the democracyfund.ca slash donate.